Right, I think it's time we get cracking. So thank you all for joining me today uh, for Infrastructure Monitoring Basics with Telegraph, Grafana and InfluxDB. So I'm a developer advocate for Influx Data, so that we're the creators of InfluxDB. Um, in my past life, I was involved in industrial IoT solutions. Now you might be wondering, why is a guy that worked on industrial IoT solutions talking to you about um, observability uh, and uh, network monitoring and infrastructure monitoring? Um, but I soon learned when I moved over to InfluxDB, there was a lot of nuances and practices that we apply in both fields, whether it be, you know, industrial, um, based on monitoring industrial machines, um, is very similar to how we monitor and look after our IT infrastructure as well. Um, so yeah, I have a massive passion for the Apache ecosystem for which InfluxDB is now built, um, a massive demo tinkerer at home. Um, I'm driven to make a uh, observability and IoT solutions accessible to all. And my belief is that the, the domain, um, the industrial success of any department belongs with the domain experts. So it's our job as providers of services to enable people in those industries to make truly data-driven decisions and provide real impact to their customers and to their users. So as I said, I come from Influx Data. So we've been involved with open source for quite a while now. Our product was founded in 2013. From very humble beginnings, we're now within over 750,000 instances worldwide. If you're familiar with Home Assistant and other projects like this, you're probably storing a lot of your time series data within InfluxDB. Um, and you know, a lot of our customers now come from our open source department, Tesla, Disney, um, Google, Google itself with their own IoT monitoring application solutions all use InfluxDB as their one-stop shop for their time series data. So on the agenda today, I thought I would basically break it down into a few stages as we got quite a bit to cover. So first of all, I wanted to establish the difference between monitoring and observability. We'll see where they're similar and also where they differentiate and why they are two separate practices. We'll then have a look at a problem. For me, problem drives learning. So let's create a scenario and see how we can solve that using observability and monitoring practices. Um, the cool thing is I actually use ChatGPT to create my observability problem, and then we will solve that observability problem. Um, so it'll be quite interesting. Um, from there, we will then do next steps. My plan is it, you should always be able to get your hands on code and get dirty with what's discussed here today. So anything that we discuss with regards to Telegraph, InfluxDB, um, Prometheus, OpenTelemetry, all of the source codes online, it's all there available for you to use. And you, know, you can come back and give me feedback later um, and so forth. So monitoring versus observability. So the core difference between monitoring and observability is twofold. Monitoring itself is the collection and analysis of metrics, logs, and events. So when you think about a metric, and say if you're familiar with Prometheus, what you're doing is you're polling an interval, say a CPU usage stat, or a storage interval time, or the capacity, and saying, what is that reading right now? What is that metric? We're going to get that every minute, every, you know, depending on your poll interval. An event is an unknown timed metric, essentially. So you could imagine uh, an event to be something like an error code or a user-driven um, action. So they clicked a series of buttons, and these are being logged and written to uh, a data store with a timestamp. We don't know when they're going to occur like we can with metrics, but they are ingestible none the same, and some of our most vital data comes from event-based data. The cool thing with event-based data is we can actually derive metrics or regular-based metrics from our event-based data using aggregation. So aggregation, I mean here is say, we have a number of errors that come in. If we count those in minute intervals, we've derived a regular metric because we know every minute we're going to get a count of how many errors, even if it's zero errors. 
So monitoring, as you can see, if we boil down to it, whether we're looking at metrics, logs, events, we are looking at the state or health of a system that is out in the world, whether it be um, in production or under development, we want to know and gauge how that system is performing, whether that be from a very hardware system capacity all the way to looking at you know, resource utilization, et cetera. Where this differs with observability, because you might be saying, OK, well, within observability, I use traces, logs and metrics as well. But there is a key differentiator here, and that's the ability to drill down into our data and work out exactly what's happening and why an error might, message might have been occurred or why a certain process that a customer has driven is causing this error message. And, and this is where you see a lot of these buzzwords like open telemetry and Jaeger as an application um, is really taking place. So when we think about monitoring, we're thinking about observing metrics over the course of machine, that system health, what's going on. And with observability, we're proactively drilling into our code to be able to work out why problems are occurring or what user-driven event happened in order to, um, in order to either better write our code um, or work in how we can optimize that as well. And so if we boil monitoring and observability into its four fields, this is kind of how I see them. Um, we have network-based monitoring. So when you think about that, we're monitoring routers, switches, firewalls. Um, we're ensuring uh, data transmission, uh, detecting bottlenecks, and identifying security threats. For server-based monitoring, we're tracking the performance and availability of physical or virtual servers. So think about CPU usage, memory consumption, disk space, response times, ensuring optimal performance and reduced downtime. Application performance monitoring or APM, monitoring the performance of software, again looking at bottlenecks in the, the architecture that we design, inefficiencies in code, database, um, code, um, how we connect with databases and how we query through databases um, and other infrastructure components. The reason I highlighted this one in blue was because for me, this is where monitoring and observability can meet. We can monitor our application infrastructure, but we can also observe our application infrastructure by looking at the traces produced within it. And then, of course, we have cloud infrastructure. And this can be a really broad term. Um, you can encapsulate server-based monitoring or application monitoring within cloud infrastructure monitoring. But really, where I want to derive it here is when we look at cloud-based services such as um, uh, if we take AWS, for instance, if we look at their own Kubernetes solution, um, if we look at any of their database services, we're basically looking at uptime, how they're performing, the, the cost analysis of this as well. So that's how I differentiate cloud infrastructure monitoring from the other fields. So. Let's look at this ChatGPT uh, driven problem. Funny enough, I feel it's tried to reproduce itself and then give us a problem within that area. So ChatGPT said it created a, um, a situation called WhisperGPT. And essentially the idea was that it was going to provide services to the greater world, which would uh, basically be a natural language process model and be used in support processing, et cetera, to provide credible responses back. The problem is for them is growth. So they had this is going to scale rapidly. Um, we're worried about key differences in things like bottlenecks, latency, um, the hardware capacity, etc. Um, and essentially, the team at Whisper GPT would like to work on how to we can build a scaled solution for monitoring each of these key components that we've discussed in a hybrid architecture. And what I mean by a hybrid architecture here is we can actually see that we have both on-site premise uh, stuff that we need to monitor and also cloud-based um, application monitoring as well. So for whatever reason in our infrastructure, in this case, we might just want to keep some of our um, some of our processing or compute on our own servers in our own um, infrastructure in our own building. So in this case, we have a series of servers running the Whisper GPT model on its own GPUs. That's talking to a backbone within AWS where we run and scale out, say, our, um, our user interface and also our API that developers interface with. So we need to talk to, we need to monitor each of these solutions within the hybrid infrastructure. 
So if we break it down into our four columns again, as you can see, we're looking at monitoring um, our, our network and routers for capacity, how many requests are coming in, how much data is being sent back from these models, you know, is, the, is our network suitable for being able to do this, um, server-based monitoring, in this case we're going to focus on CPU and GPU usage um, because we're running our models based on GPUs as well, um, application performance monitoring, this is where we really focus on how well um, the, the Kubernetes cluster that's holding up our model or our application here is being able to scale and differentiate, you know, where should I be pushing traffic to, how many number of requests should that model have. And then lastly, we'll look at cloud infrastructure monitoring. We'll be looking at cost and uptime of running um, our solution on services like AppRunner or Am uh, Amazon uh, EKS for basically our API and our uh, user interface. If I can get this to move on. There we go. So let's solve the problem. So as we've seen, there's quite a bit of a mountain that we need to climb. So what I thought we would do is split it into three sections. Data collection, data storage, and data in action. So first, let's talk about data collection. So Telegraph, if you don't know, is quite a popular metrics collector. Um, it's open source fully. It's been around for quite a while now. Um, it has over 12.6K stars on GitHub. Um, and it's all a single binary written in Go. It's all TOML based, um, and so it requires a very limited. It requires very limited knowledge of uh, software or coding capabilities in order to be able to use and run it. And when I say it's community driven, it very much is community driven. As we said, with the 300 plus plugins that we've contributed, um, most of these plugins have been written by the community for the community. And we, as Influx Data, are just stewards for the Telegraph project. So you can see in these list of input plugins here, I've kind of highlighted a few that might be useful for us in this solving this problem, um, such as CloudWatch, uh, CPU, Disk Stats, Disk IO, Gemini. Um, we have other protocol-based plugins. Um, we have um, memory, uh, Kubernetes monitoring infrastructure, NVIDIA SMI for monitoring our GPU capabilities. I always like to highlight the Minecraft one in orange. We will accept any plugin if it's useful to someone and the code is great. So in this case, someone wanted to monitor their Minecraft gaming instance. The code was awesome. It solved a problem. It was contributed as an input plugin. So very much an open source project. And yeah, and it, the list goes on. You can see here, and we'll cover a lot more of these as we go. I think I missed the page. Ah, open telemetry up there as well. That'll be a good one we'll cover later as well. So, and if we look at the Telegraph architecture under the binary, this is kind of how our plugins hook up. We have a series of input plugins where we collect our data form from. We then have processor and aggregator plugins. This allows us to enrich our data and also pre-aggregate some of our data if we so wish to. And then we have a series of output plugins. So we're going to talk about the InfluxDB output plugin today, but that's not to say if you want to send it to MongoDB or if you want to send it to CloudWatch or if you want to send it to an open telemetry collector because you have other um, methods that you want to use to push that data or to other aspects, then you have that versatility with Telegraph. You're not restricted to just sending your data to InfluxDB. So Telegraph setup. So Telegraph is meant to be highly versatile in how you set it up. We have flavors in most, uh, in most Linux binaries, so Ubuntu, SUSE, um, Red Hat. Uh, most binaries are all covered for Linux. We also have Windows as well, Mac OS, Docker. We have Helms available. Um, and essentially, all you need to do is create a Telegraph config, which I'll show you in a moment. That's just a TOML-based config. Um, then you can test your, com um, your config based on a series of these commands. So you can see here, like, Telegraph dash dash debug, give it your Telegraph config and check how your 
plugins are collecting data. Dash dash test is a really cool one that I like to show people because that allows you to collect from your input plugins but not send your data to your output plugins. So that means if you have any issues with the data that you're collecting, you can catch those before you actually start writing them to a database or to your end source. And then Telegraph dash dash once is great for testing your output plugins because it only sends one sample rather than say 5,000, 10,000 metrics at a time um, before you get to that point. And once you've done that is deploy. So whether you're deploying it as a Windows service, Kubernetes, Docker Compose, System CTL, Telegraph is pretty versatile on how you plug and play it into your infrastructure. So I won't have enough time to cover it in the talk today, but you can also sidecar Telegraph into Kubernetes. I wanted to leave that up there just in case you guys wanted it, but it's just a simple demo um, on the repository there so you can see how you can uh, sidecar Telegraph um, into your Kubernetes infrastructure. The cool thing about this demo is um, we actually use the Prometheus input plugin. So we basically monitor our application and also monitor the Kubernetes infrastructure using Prometheus endpoints, scrape all these and send these into InfluxDB. So we fully acknowledge Prometheus as the, the master of all monitoring when it comes to Kubernetes, but it just shows you can, in, you can integrate other agents within this infrastructure and have more versatility over the components that you're monitoring. So here's a Telegraph config. This is basically the agent config. So this is the global config. And so what you can see here is just some simple, I just wanted to highlight some simple configuration based bits just to get you started. So the interval for most plugins is when we poll for data. Um, there are certain plugins which are push uh, input plugins as well. So we don't make use of the interval. Um, you can set a global interval or you can set an interval per plugin. So you can collect, um, say, down to, say, a one millisecond interval, or you could potentially um, only query on certain plugins every two hours or over two days or something like that. Um, Basically, any data collected in the input plugin is put into a memory buffer. So if for whatever reason, if your network goes down, uh, these samples are stored within the message queue. And then when you come back online, they will be written out of the message queue. So you have the ability to, to supply a batch size as well as a buffer limit um, to that service. So just, just as you know, the bigger queue that you have, the more memory that you need, to, uh, just as a simple one there, because we've seen people put astronomical queues in before and go, why have I run out of memory? And uh, you know, that's because you've stopped connecting to the internet and you've got too many metrics in your buffer. Um, so that's some of the agent specific configuration. Let's move into the actual input plugins that we'll be using to solve this problem. So to solve our network problem, we'll be using SNMP, which is a um, simple network management protocol. Through Telegraph, we can monitor our routers, um, our firewalls through this method. Um, we can actually do this through SNMP to poll these endpoints. So we can ask Telegraph to reach out and say, hey, tell me the status of this router or tell me the status of this uh, firewall currently. Um, or we can also monitor traps as well. So we can actually feed the data directly back from firewalls or routers if an event occurs into Telegraph as our, as our collection server. So you can see in this case, we're just gonna do really basic. We're gonna go give me the system uptime for this router. Um, and we're also gonna give me the system name, but there's lots of other, we could also say monitor temperature, monitor usage, monitor network throughput of routers. Um, and there's great examples for Cisco based routers um, and others online. So similar on the rest, this one's quite bog standard. We have CPU, um, we also have open telemetry, which I'll cover in a second. And then we have CloudWatch metrics. So in this case, what we said we would do is we'd use CloudWatch to basically monitor all of the different um, uh, basically all the different AWS parts, and then we'll collect from CloudWatch all the metrics we want from all our different services. So as you can see, we also have output plugins. We're gonna be using the Influx DB V2 plugin there. And then here you can see is basically an example of writing the data to InfluxDB. Here's the configuration here. But like we said, you can also write to Prometheus, OpenTelemetry, AWS, Azure based output plugins as well. So we've covered data collection. Let's talk quickly about data storage. 
So, InfluxDB is a purpose-built time series database. It's now built on Arrow, Parquet, and DataVution. So it's designed for ingesting millions, um, if not billions of metrics per second of high cardinality data. The idea is InfluxDB is, Influx is schema on write, so you don't have to define a schema beforehand, which means you can keep modifying it as you go. Um, we can we can query uh, and write data on the leading edge of millions of rows per second since we're using a column of store. We can be a single uh, database for both metrics, logs, and traces, which I'll show you in a minute within the demo. Um, and we now support with new InfluxDB 3.0 SQL support. So if you are a SQL user, um, you don't have to worry about learning a new query language. You can use SQL directly with InfluxDB. And this is just a quick bird's eye view of like the flow of InfluxDB 3.0 from data collection, data storage, and data visualization. So to understand a database, I think it's good to understand the core data model. So let me quickly brush through this. So a bucket is closely resembles a database with one key difference. It allows you to set a retention policy within a time series database. Um, it might depend, but your data as it gets older um, either gets more useless or less uh, interesting to you based on the new data that you have coming in. It also allows you to maintain the, you know, the high, um, if you're storing lots of high volume time series data, this also allows you to maintain your disk space as well. So suppose we could set a 30 day retention policy on our bucket. When our data timestamp becomes older than 30 days, it will automatically delete that data so we can bring new data in. You can set unlimited retention if you need to, but most people decide how they set up retention policies and then they can say, okay, well, here's all my raw data into a seven day bucket. I'll then move it to a, a longer term storage bucket of 30 days when I downsample and I aggregate that bucket. Measurements you can see as tables, that's our containerization. Tag sets are part of our primary key. That's how we differentiate our date, our series or our data points from one another if they share the same timestamp. Field sets contain our actual data or our readings, so numerical strings and representation. Then we also have our timestamp, which can be down to nanosecond precision. And then a series is a unique combination of measurement and tags. So you could imagine that being, so if we work this down into the data model, here is an example. So in this example, we have our measurement is server. Our tag set, which is part of our primary key, is the host name of where the data came from and also its location. We then say in within our field set, we have our memory, our CPU, and then we also have our timestamp associated. And this is how InfluxDB ingests data, called, which is called line protocol. Um, you don't have to worry about line protocol. Telegraph does that all for you. You just collect it, and that's what the output plugin does, writes all of this within to line protocol for you so InfluxDB can ingest it. So just some schema recommendations. Um, I'm just going to really brush on these. Um, avoid wide schemas, avoid sparse schemas. The way you do this is through a homogeneous uh, architecture, which means, which I'll show you in a second, um, but it essentially means try and keep your tables consistent. Store all your network data in one table, store all of your application monitoring data in another, um, and that prevents you from having, say, lots of null values or a wide schema that has too many columns with irrelevant data. The second thing is design for query simplicity. So remember using SQL or uh, InfluxQL, whichever query language you plan to use. Um, if you have really rogue names for your columns, uh, just remember you need to query these columns later. So if you call a column uh, server 124xy-247 something, um, you're gonna have to write that within your SQL query. You're gonna have to escape those special characters. So we advise keeping your table names, sorry, with column names, simple. And so this is what I mean by homogeneous, keeping all of your data consistent within their containers. So measurement one could be your network, uh, measurement two could be your server, application, and cloud-based monitoring. Let's just check in time. So I wanted to really hi highlight a new use case for InfluxDB based on our new storage engine, our new version. We are now focused on supporting open telemetry, which means we can store traces, metrics, and logs all within InfluxDB in one storage engine rather than spreading them to different dedicated storage engines for metrics, logs, and traces. 
So I just wanted to show you kind of how like the schema looked here for open telemetry for us. You won't have to worry about this. I'll show you how the demo works and how we transition this. But you can now see that within each table, we can store our spans, our logs, and our metrics for application-based monitoring. Um, and this has been made possible by our new storage engine, which has an un uh, unlimited cardinality or um, what we call like the, we've basically removed the idea that when we create a tag, which is a unique ID, you don't have to worry about runaway cardinality or runaway tags, which could have an infinite number of values. Um, and so this is what's made open telemetry monitoring and trace monitoring possible for us. So last thing to mention on InfluxDB is you can also use InfluxDB within a hybrid solution. So we understand that a lot of people sometimes want to keep their database close to their source or at the edge. So what you can do is you can install InfluxDB locally, say on your server. You could collect all of your raw data locally. Um, you could then downsample or aggregate that data locally, and then you can write that data to a more global source. And this is exactly what edge data replication allows you to do. Essentially, as data is written into a bucket, we then automatically put that into a durable queue, which then writes that data to your um, remote instance of InfluxDB. So just a cool new feature that was added to InfluxDB open source quite recently. So we've covered data collection, covered data storage. Let's finally talk a little bit about data in action. So we love Grafana. Grafana has been pals with us for a long time. Um, yes, they have their own solutions for time series and logs and traces as well. But we go well, um, we're first class customers and we go a long way back with each other. So it is our primary way, it's our primary user interface and dashboarding method for InfluxDB. So Grafana flavors. There is Grafana Cloud and Grafana Open Source. Um, we have plugins for each, and you can interact with InfluxDB through three methods Flight SQL, InfluxQL, and Flux. We're going to focus on Flight SQL today, which is uh, the SQL engine, um, just since that's new to InfluxDB. So, if you're not familiar with Grafana, the, the, the flow works as so. Essentially, what you do is you define a data source. So in this case, we're using the Flight SQL plugin. Um, we basically specify our InfluxDB endpoint. We specify a token, which is our security interface with InfluxDB. And then we supply some metadata. So the metadata here is the bucket name. Now, the reason we supply metadata is we actually contributed this Flight SQL plugin to the open source community. So anyone that has a Flight SQL endpoint, such as Dreamio or Druid or any of the other Columnar stores, can actually make use of the Flight SQL plugin. Um, and that's you know, our commitment to open source as a company. From there, you then use the Explorer to create your query. So we're just writing a standard query here that you can see in SQL. So we're just collecting a few columns and we're spe specifying the time range that we want to collect that data in. And we can return a table within Grafana. From there, we can then use that time series table and create a visualization, which I'll show you in the demo. So in this case, we're just basically monitoring our usage. Um, and you can see we've differentiated our usage into different series. So we have CPU four, five, also the total amount there. And that's where tags come in. If we didn't tag our CPU types, we wouldn't be able to differentiate between uh, the different types of um, the different uh, metrics coming from each CPU reading. So just some useful queries for you um, within SQL. Uh, within this case, you have data bin. This is how you create uh, time-based aggregations in SQL. So you can basically define within um, Grafana, say, OK, I want to bin all of my data into five-minute intervals. And then I want to average that data within those five-minute bins. Um, so that's kind of what the SQL command at the top is showing you. In the next one, you can see these, these select a last and select a first functions. These are specific to uh, InfluxDB and to Flight SQL. So they're time series based functions, and they say you can select the last row based on a given time or select the first row um, on a given time. So that's great for gauges, whereas averaging out your data is great for line graphs and charts like that. Um, so it's depending on what, how you're querying, think about how you want to visualize your data. And this will help you in terms of how you want to build your queries. 
So um, I've left a, dash, um, a QR code here. So this is a basic quick start dashboard that we've created. Um, so it basically gives you the system stats for your system. You basically use Telegraph to monitor like disk usage, memory, system. Um, we write all that to InfluxDB, and then we built a dashboard that you can see yourself um, that will visualize all these using SQL. You can also be proactive in Grafana. You can also do alerting. Um, the alerting in Grafana is extremely powerful because the, the way that you can do it is you can basically say, define a threshold and say, say if my CPU usage is above a certain limit, um, if it stays above that a limit for say two minutes, um, you can then trigger an alert. And there's a variety of ways you can trigger an alert through Grafana, whether it be through Prometheus, Slack, you can even write the data back into Telegraph to use other output plugins, PagerDuty. Um, the Grafana alerting system is pretty versatile. So I think time's getting away from me a little, but yeah. So as you can see here, we, we've built our different components. We have data collection, data storage, and data in action. And that's not to say you can't just use Grafana. You could build out your own solution with any of the client libraries. You could use data, data analytics engines like Apache Spark and Data Fusion, um, sorry, Rapid Miner. Uh, and then there are other visualization platforms as well as Grafana, such as Superset, which I advise you to check out as well. So I'm not sure if I'll be able to cover the demo looking at time, um, but this is kind of the demo that you can try at home. Um, essentially what this does, instead of using um, Telegraph, it uses the open telemetry collector. What we do is we collect the data from Hot Rod. We write that data directly into InfluxDB, including span, log, uh, logs, and um, metrics that should be rather than latency. Um, we then use Jaeger query to basically query that data back out, and we use that as our bridging in, uh, in, uh, interface with Grafana. So we use a Jaeger data source, and that basically says any commands coming from Grafana, basically go into Jaeger query, we convert those Jaeger query, that Jaeger query into SQL, and then we ask InfluxDB for those results. So that's how we can interface directly with our query data, sorry, our trace data. Um, I think I can quickly uh, show you if I do this really quickly. So you can see the hot rod demo here. If I quickly generate a trace and I navigate over to Grafana, you can see this is our Grafana interface here for monitoring our traces. This is over the last 90 days. Um, I can bring this down to say the last five minutes. And then, so basically what we can do is we can click on a trace here. We can see the schema, the, sorry, the relationships of all the spans within that trace. And then we can actually also drill into our trace as well as part of our observability stack. And all of that data is stored within InfluxDB. So we've not had to use multiple different data sources to combine that data. That is all directly within InfluxDB. So I believe I swap back across. So I won't jump over this, but as you can see, we've kind of gone full circle in monitoring our solution. Um, we've used Telegraph as the backbone for most of our data collection here, whether it be monitoring our actual applications, um, our cloud-based infrastructure, um, also looking at our open telemetry as well. We store all of this data even in different tables or different buckets within InfluxDB, and then we use Grafana as our central visualization and observability platform connected to InfluxDB. So next steps, how can you get cracking and try all of this yourself? So first place I recommend starting is Quick Starts. So uh, we created this repository to, an, to get you started with a series of Grafana dashboards and also Telegraph configurations. Um, you can use that QR code. Um, I, I try and add to it when I can based on community feedback. Um, so I add more as we go as well. If you would like to try the open telemetry demo and get started with open telemetry, for me, open telemetry um, 
is the next bandwagon to be part of. Um, it's on a bit of like a, I think the guys from Adobe said it was on a bit of a hockey stick trajectory. We're kind of really, you know, only scraping the surface of popularity within open telemetry. So definitely one to get started with. Um, I use Killer Coder. So Killer Coder is just an online education tool. It means you don't actually have to install the repo, or sorry, pull the repo and then configure it yourself. You can just follow the step-by-step -step tutorial on Killer Coder. Hopefully everyone got that one right, yeah. And then last but not least, as a DevRel, I would not be doing my job if I said, do not get, uh, do not, uh, get involved with our community, please. Um, we have a vibrant community on Slack and Discourse. We're there all the time, um, answering questions, looking at um, humble, um, solutions for home projects and also we have people contributing directly to telegraph influx db and other projects um, as well as our open telemetry connector as well for for that case so please get involved with our community we wouldn't be here without you guys so and it's always exciting to have new members um, we also have influx dbu which has further courses on learning telegraph influx db and so forth as well and hopefully I've left enough time for questions. Sorry, I felt like there's probably a lot of content in there. Um, but thank you very much, guys. I hope that was insightful enough uh, to get you started. And does anyone have any questions? No. I think I've done. What was it? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so we start. We store everything within Parquet format now. Um, so for us, we've actually been experimenting the compression of logs um, within sort of Parquet format. Um, we're, I would say if we're talking real speak here, there's still more to be done in how we can compress the logs in Parquet, um, but it's made a sizable difference compared to our last storage engine, which was uh, TSM, which was our time series merge tree. Um, so it's been, it's the, yeah, so we're, we're on the road to having much better compression for logs in that matter as well. Yeah. Yeah. With InfluxDB in the time series storage, mm -hmm. So, so funny you should mention this, and this is a, um, so we're actually releasing a feature for InfluxDB that's coming out soon, which is basically a retention-based downsampling. Um, and essentially what that will allow you to do is exactly what you said, which is, um, so I should be repeating these questions, part of the thing, but the, essentially what he asked was, is can I essentially, when data is being deleted as part of a retention policy, um, can I move that? Can I aggregate that data and move that to a different bucket? It's kind of like the crux of your question. And yes, we do have a feature that's coming, which basically says, if data is being deleted, that last section of data on that 30 days, you could say, take the average or take the last sample within that silo of data that's being deleted and move that to a bucket that has a longer retention policy. So yeah, we're actively looking into that because that's been a feature that's been requested for a long time to be able to do that. Also within the uh, open source product, just to mention as well, we have a task-based uh, system, which allows you to do some of this um, downsampling and aggregation between buckets as well. Sweet. <laughs>